Hey everyone, I'm Marco Bucci, and I'm not a historian, but I think we owe the term ambient occlusion to 3D software developers. I still remember in the, what, late 90s, everyone I knew who worked with 3D graphics was totally geeking out about it. And for good reason too, I mean back then it was almost routine for CG renders to look kinda dull and lifeless like this. Then suddenly this unassuming ambient occlusion box could turn even primitive scenes into something much more natural looking. And if I compare them side by side, it's obvious that it has something to do with the shadows. The render on the left looks like it takes place on the moon, whereas on the right there's now this really subtle shading going on in the shadows. Now again, not a historian, but in recent history, it seems that the term ambient occlusion has been corrupted. Namely, people have dropped the word ambient and tacked on the word shadows. This is kind of unfortunate though, because it confuses a perfectly accurate term. And trust me, I'm not trying to sound pedantic. Actually, I think pointing this out will help us understand what ambient occlusion is. So for the moment, let's throw out occlusion shadows and bring back ambient occlusion. Because this little word is extremely relevant. Okay, so I've got a little scene set up here, and I'm going to pretend like it's lit by the sun. Like that. And I have gone ahead and made a simple shadow pass for our sphere. This shadow is made of two parts. This is a form shadow, like the form of the sphere is turning into shadow. And this is the cast shadow projected onto the ground. Now, this looks good as a block in, but if we want the light to be more realistic, we need to address what's going on in this shadow. Because in real life, as I'm sure you know, shadows are not just opaquely dark like this. They have light. In fact, the light we see in shadow is called ambient light. And we can't understand ambient occlusion without first understanding ambient light. So I'm going to not be lazy and spend a few minutes on this, which will really pay off later, trust me. Now, ambient light is sometimes referred to as indirect light, reflected light, bounced light. It depends on who you're talking to, but they all mean the same thing. I'm going to shrink this down and put it over here and make a quick note to remind us that ambient light is found in shadow. Okay, so if ambient light is indirect light, the other category is direct light. Direct light is emitted from a single source, like the sun or a light bulb is another common example. Direct light comes directly into our scene in coordinated straight lines, like soldiers obeying marching orders. And when the light hits an object, it creates a high contrast shape of light. And conversely, what that direct light does not hit is going to be shadow. So the direct light really dictates most of what's going on in our scene. Direct light is very strong, and I'm going to write that here in our notes. Great. Okay, so let's just take these layers away so we can see our scene better. Now, with all that as prologue, let's get back to talking about ambient light and where ambient occlusion eventually fits into all this. The reason shadows aren't just flat dark like this is because light bounces. In this example, many of the sun's rays would hit the floor, and when they do, they don't just die, they bounce back up. But it's not equal, like they don't all bounce at exactly the same angle. Because the surfaces in the world are imperfect, they're not perfectly smooth, those bounced angles are going to go like something like this. It's going to be completely random. And of course, real life has different objects in it. There's going to be like a wall here, or a, maybe it's a building. Maybe there's a tree over here and people walking around. All of this is going to just bounce like crazy, light everywhere. This is the nature of ambient light, and you can see why it's also called indirect light, reflected light, bounced light, that it describes what these light rays are doing. And you know what? There's yet another term for this that I forgot. Diffuse light. They all refer to the same thing. And let's just hide this for a moment, because in our scene, which is outdoors, skylight comes into play, which is also ambient light. And that skylight hits things and bounces around like crazy. Ambient light is like the Wild West over here. Now, one other thing to note about ambient light is that it's very weak, much weaker than a direct light like the sun. Think of it like secondhand light, thirdhand light, or more. Each time a light ray bounces off something, it gets dramatically weaker. So where our direct light was very strong, our ambient light is weak. And that's precisely why ambient light only shows up in shadow. So our task now is to figure out where and how all those rogue light rays are going to find their way into our shadows. Because it's not just equal. I mean, I can't just do this. That's just as unrealistic. So I'll undo that. But why was that unrealistic? Well, pretend that you are this little light ray, and eventually you're going to make your way into the shadow somehow. You might go this way and kind of bounce up here. And now, now you're this light ray, and you're going to maybe travel behind the sphere. 
and hit a little piece of ground that's kind of angled like that and you're also going to bounce back up this way. Statistically, most of these light rays are going to find areas of shadow that are most open to the air, maybe represented by this blue area. This area of shadow is the most open to the air. I mean, we can be a we can pretend that we're light from the sky coming in. We can easily find our way here because this area of shadow is just very available to us. We also might find our way into this area of shadow, which is also very open to the environment. Now this area here, right where our sphere meets the table, you can imagine it's far less likely that a light ray is gonna be able to find its way in here. It's such a tight space in there. I mean, some light rays might find their way in, but it's not hard to imagine that when these light rays bounce into shadow, only a few are gonna hit these tight spaces and you'll get increasingly more light as the shadow exposes itself more to the environment. So the most is gonna happen up here and also this area of cast shadow, kind of a map like this. So as I paint in the ambient light for real, I'll just make sure I follow that kind of mental map where most of the value is gonna lighten our shadows in the areas that are more exposed to the environment. And then as we get into these tighter spaces, the value remains dark. In fact, what I might do just to demonstrate is I'll lighten everything in the way that I said I wouldn't do. Uh, and then I'll just indicate those tighter spaces by painting back down to dark. And I'm treating the edges very softly, like where that sphere meets ground, it's gonna be a very soft statement there because fewer light rays means less visual information. So I'm gonna leave that area unresolved which basically translates to a soft edge transition where that sphere meets table. And of course, I'm only working in values, not color, for demonstration purposes. And here's the final result with all our ambient light taken care of. And okay, folks, it's this area where the sphere meets the table, the tightest space where I've left it the darkest. That is the area of ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is just the area where ambient light is occluded. And occlude is just a fancy word for block or close or obstruct. Maybe a more practical definition is ambient occlusion is the area of shadow that gets the least amount of reflected light, making it the darkest part of the shadow. All right, let's take a look at some photographs where we can see this happening in the real world. Vehicles just so happen to cause nice ambient occlusion. I've also got this little legend here, so when I mark up these photos, I'll use these colors to indicate various degrees of ambient occlusion. So let's point out the obvious first. This is a sunlight scene, just like our sphere demonstration. The vehicle is casting a shadow like this. Inside that shadow is ambient light, which means there is also ambient occlusion. The most occlusion is happening in here, at the tightest space underneath the vehicle. When I take those marks away, you can really see it. It's a darkening of the shadow. And why is the shadow darker in that area? Well, in this case, the diffuse skylight is illuminating this area of shadow. This is the area of shadow that's very available to the ambient light. It's very open to the air. So it stands to reason that when skylight comes down into this scene, statistically, most of it is gonna find its way into the outer areas of shadow. Fewer light rays, but still some, will find their way into this area, which is getting darker, which means it's getting more occluded from the ambient light, but still kind of light. It's a very soft transition, right? And then we get into what I've already outlined, the darkest passage of shadow happening directly underneath the vehicle. Here's a slightly modified situation. We're still in sunlight, but instead of the vehicles casting the shadow, these vehicles are already in an area of cast shadow, which means that this entire area is dominated by ambient light. So let's start with the blue. We can see the least amount of occlusion, or in other words, the lightest areas of shadow happening, you know, generally in here. And no surprise, this is the area that's most open to the environment. It'd be easy for light rays from the sky to come in, also sunlight that has bounced off the ground, up here, and then back down here. And of course, that would be happening across the entire scene. Now let's jump to the red marks, the most ambient occlusion, the darkest part of the shadow, just like before, happens right underneath the vehicles because that is the part that is the hardest for any rogue light ray to get to. Mathematically, it's less likely that a light ray would find its way underneath these vehicles. Or by the time light rays do find themselves underneath the vehicles, they've kind of bounced around so many times and as a result, they've lost their intensity, which just registers as darkness. And I want to quickly remind you that the effect is very soft. So the green area, the medium occlusion, is kind of a transition area from the most occlusion out to the least occlusion. That's all it is, it's a very soft edge. If I take that layer away, you can see there's nothing at all hard-edged about ambient occlusion. 
Here's a close-up of those vehicles, and we can plainly see the very soft transition out from the most ambient occlusion into the area of least ambient occlusion. It's a sensitive and subtle effect. This photograph illustrates a basic but important characteristic of ambient light. First of all, it's this gas station rooftop shelter thing that's casting this large shadow, right? And the basic truth of ambient light is ambient light wants to invade shadows. That's what ambient light does. And in this case, because the object casting the shadow is so far away from the shadow, there's just so much room for the skylight to sneak in, for bounced sunlight to sneak in. There's very little, if any, ambient occlusion in this shadow. I mean, we can get all picky and point out these little crevices here and underneath the people in the bike there, but those notwithstanding, this shadow is completely filled up by ambient light. To show you how ambient occlusion interacts with distance, I've got this cute little car model. And if you look underneath the car, you'll see that familiar ambient occlusion, just like in the photos. Now check this out. Car goes up, car goes down, car goes up, car goes down. Did you catch what happened with the ambient occlusion there? Well, let's run that again. Car goes up, car goes down. You saw the gradual fading, right? When the car is hugging the ground so tightly, we get that dark ambient occlusion. But when the car goes up, so much ambient light finds its way into that shadow that it obliterates the ambient occlusion. Car goes down. <clears throat> Here's that scene again with the sunlight removed. This is now lit entirely by ambient light, just like you'd have on an overcast day, for example. And let's run the same experiment. Car goes up, car goes down. Car goes up, car goes down. Believe it or not, the behavior of the ambient occlusion did not change. It's just that in this scene, we only have ambient light. So when the car goes up, the ambient occlusion goes away and it looks like the shadow has gone away, but that's not accurate. Remember that ambient occlusion is not the shadow, it's just the darkest part of the shadow. I like to think of overcast light as like one giant cast shadow, and I'll use this photograph to illustrate what I mean. There are some dramatic clouds in the sky here, which is causing a big portion of this landscape to be in shadow, while other portions of the landscape are receiving rays from the sun. Now, if we imagine an altered version of this scene where the clouds are completely covering the sky, in other words, overcast, we'd have something that looks more like this. All those clouds completely cast the earth in shadow. Or another way of saying that is the earth is completely lit by ambient light. Overcast light can be challenging to paint because you no longer have those nice shapes of light and shadow. The earth is entirely in shadow, so you only have ambient light to work with. But knowledge of ambient occlusion can really help with this. So here are some real world cars lit entirely by ambient light on an overcast day, just like I showed you a moment ago with my 3D car model. Now in this situation, the entire picture is a cast shadow. So this whole area is the area of least ambient occlusion. Also in here, in here, those are all areas very accessible to the skylight that's coming down. And naturally, it'd be very hard for these light rays to get underneath these tight spaces of the cars. So we have our most ambient occlusion here. And while I have my red marker out, look at this entire area where this recess of the building is. That's all ambient occlusion. Light rays have a harder time getting in there. And then switching to the green, the medium ambient occlusion, you know, you can see the soft edge transition that happens from, from red to blue, basically. The medium levels of occlusion. Maybe even this part of the wall here might be considered medium occlusion. Here's another overcast scene that really demonstrates the car goes up, car goes down principle. This big awning structure is occluding some of the ambient light down here. But let's take a look at it. Because the awning is so far above the ground, I would consider this medium occlusion. Whereas directly underneath this bench here, this is most occlusion. Because car goes down, the bench is closer to the ground. Also, take a look at the space underneath the awning. This is a very tight space. For light to get in there, it would have to come down and bounce up. But overcast light, or ambient light, is very weak, so it can't really manage that. In fact, this whole pole structure is mostly dark up there. It gets lighter here because daylight might be able to sneak its way in. Also, it might be able to bounce up like this without losing too much intensity. Interior scenes can be challenging because they too are often lit by ambient light. And I'm sure you can see the darkest areas of this picture happen to be the tightest spaces, just like you'd expect with outdoor ambient occlusion. However, one thing that might be confusing is why does the ambient occlusion appear to have a direction to it? Like why is the occlusion underneath the desk darker here 
and less dark here. You know, should it not be more even like this, just like we saw underneath the cars when we were outdoors? Same thing underneath the chair. Why is it not like this? And the answer is, if this scene were outdoors, that would be exactly the case, because the ambient light would be coming in from about, you know, roughly 180 degrees, which would kind of average out and put the occlusion directly underneath the objects. However, in this scene, there's clearly a window over here, so the ambient light that's bouncing around is going to be stronger over here on the right, getting progressively weaker as we move to the left side of the picture. This kind of directional ambient light is characteristic of many interior scenes, so you really got to have that in mind when you paint them. I think it's important at this point to remind everyone that ambient occlusion only exists in the areas where ambient light is visible. Remember that a direct light like the sun is strong and will completely overtake ambient light. So we're simply not going to see ambient occlusion where the sun is hitting. I think it'd be a very common mistake to look at the front of the van and say, well, it overhangs the ground here. So wouldn't that mean that this area of the street would be occluded and therefore darker? And the answer is no, because the sun is hitting that area. The sun is a direct light, and direct light essentially renders ambient light invisible. Ambient occlusion is reserved for the shadows, because after all, that's where there is ambient light to be occluded. All right, let's wrap up with some art examples, and I'll show you how I go about painting this stuff. Starting with this one, two owls in the ambient shadow of this forest. Light is coming from pretty much 180 degrees, which means that I'm going to put the most occlusion, no surprise, beneath them, just like we've seen in the photographs. And true to life, I will have that occlusion kind of fade away gradually. Maybe some just underneath the eyes here, underneath the beak, little touches of it underneath the wings. Actually, a lot of occlusion happening underneath this eye socket. A little less happening under here. Zooming in here, you can see that unlike the sphere demo I did earlier, I'm not just using an airbrush to darken things. I'm using all kinds of brush strokes, from thick textured brush strokes to smaller strokes to smudgy strokes. The brush strokes you make are part of your style and are separate from the application of the fundamentals. The fundamentals simply dictates that I darken my value sufficiently enough in areas that have ambient occlusion. So you can see under the beak here, you can see a bit of airbrush there. In fact, let me just paint this out and I'll show you how I might have gone about painting this. Of course, I can't remember exactly stroke for stroke, but um, I might have blocked in a value with a, a, you know, a regular chalky brush like this. Then I might have got my smudge tool out, which I really enjoy, and smudged some values around and, and got those edges working, kind of thinking about medium occlusion here as that edge kind of tapers out back into the light. And maybe something like this. Then maybe I'll get an airbrush, set it to multiply, and as a last touch, just darken this tightest space here ever so softly to kind of really sell the effect and add some subtlety to it. This painting has a little bit of sunlight in it, but mostly it's in shadow, which means in this entire area, I'll be dealing with degrees of ambient occlusion. One thing I like about ambient occlusion is it gives you a nice excuse to have beautiful soft edges. So if you look at this area occluded by the book, you can see just like the owl's beak, there is a soft edge that makes a really nice subtle transition there. There is ambient occlusion down here as well, where the monster meets the water, this tight space there. But in this case, the transition out of ambient occlusion is much broader. The same green area would apply also to the water here as we get more into less occlusion out here. And while I have my blue marker, this area of the monster has virtually no ambient occlusion because I'm sure you've guessed it already, that area is exposed to the environment. So zooming in here, once again, I just wanted to demonstrate the variety of brush strokes that I use. I just do that to keep things interesting. You can see some airbrushing here, but that's contrasted by uh, much harder brush strokes in these areas. And again, that same kind of aesthetic is applied up here as well. Probably I use a lot of smudge tool to get this kind of effect. I like the smudge tool because I can make a, a hard brush stroke like that, or if I just held it down, I can taper it and get all kinds of edge work with it. Even little tiny areas like the book, there's more ambient occlusion here in that deep crevice of the book and less occlusion here as this area is more available to the reflected light. So even if you're painting cartoony or illustrative scenes, you can really give them a ring of truth by first understanding and then applying real world lighting fundamentals. This painting is of the real world. It's one of the many sketches I do in my sketchbook from life. It's very common to see ambient occlusion just underneath rooftops, like where the eaves overhang the walls. I've got a close-up of that section here, 
I painted this in watercolor. So what I initially did was laid in the least ambient occlusion like this. And then into that wash, while it was still wet, I put the most ambient occlusion, like a darker value. And the wet media gave me this nice transition for free, which I then further adjusted with little splotchy marks and scratchy marks, just things I like to do when I paint. You know, painting for me is at its best when it's the artist's personality laid over the fundamentals. And I hope this video helped tighten your fundamentals a little bit. There's still more to learn here though, for instance, how ambient light interacts with color, but I'll save that for a future video. As usual, big thanks to my Patreon supporters, and a quick announcement, I just crossed 100 patrons. And to express my gratitude, we're going to have a two-hour live chat where we can talk painting, art, I'll do demos, get to questions, etc. It will happen on Thursday, May the 3rd, 2018, and will be available to all Patreon tier levels. If you sign up before then, you'll be invited, so I hope to see you there. And for the rest of you, I'll see you in the next video.